Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Mary Simon was born in Kangik, Siwalu-Juak, Quebec, on Nunavut's Angava coast. Beginning her working life in the early 1970s as a journalist with CBC Northern Service, she was soon called to leadership positions with Inuit organizations. She was part of the generation of Northern Aboriginal people who righted the balance, redressed the imbalance in Canadian political economic life uh, in Northern Canada and redrew the map of Canada. Ms. Simon was president of Makovic Corporation in its formative years. Makovic is the Inuit organization responsible for implementing the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement, which was the first comprehensive land claims agreement in Canada. She was one of the senior negotiators during the Canadian constitutional discussions in the early 1980s, which led to constitutional recognition of Aboriginal rights. Ms. Simon was a major participant in subsequent constitutional discussions, including those leading to the Charlottetown Accord. She was a member of the Nunavut Implementation Commission and in the 1990s was policy co-director of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Mary Simon has also had a distinguished international career. She served two terms as president of the Inuit Circumpolar Conference the international body representing Inuit from Canada, Greenland, Alaska, and Russia. From 1994 to 2003, she was Canada's ambassador for circumpolar affairs, the first Inuk to hold an ambassadorial position. She had a major influence on Canada's northern foreign policy, negotiating the creation of the first international circumpolar organization, the Arctic Council. She was Canada's representative to the Arctic Council and its first chair. Concurrently, Mary Simon was the Canadian ambassador to Denmark, chair of the Joint Public Advisory Committee of NAFTA's Commission on Environmental Cooperation, and counselor for the International Council for Conflict Resolution at the Carter Centre. Today, Ms. Simon is in her second term as president of Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, the National Inuit Organization, where she continues to work for the development of healthy northern societies. Education and the improvements of the lives of children are particular priorities. Mary Simon's lifetime contribution to Canada is characterized by unusual vision, wisdom, and great generosity of spirit. She is principled and courageous committed to cooperation and constructive engagement in working for social justice. No matter how difficult the circumstances, she never resorted to sloganeering or negativity, rather responding with grace, integrity, and determination. She is one of our time's great social and political innovators in the development of Makovic, the creation of the Arctic Council, in her important work at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, in her service to education, and most recently in her proposal for a Canadian social charter to address poverty and social inequality. Mr. Chancellor, in recognition of outstanding dedication and commitment to Inuit rights, social justice and education, and leadership in circumpolar affairs, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, upon Mary May Simon. By virtue of my authority, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, Hoy en Namik, un nusakut, 
Thank you and good afternoon. I would first like to thank my dear friend Frances Abel for the very kind introduction. She was very generous <laughs> in her introduction of me, uh, but I truly appreciate it. And I want to thank also uh, uh, David Sehwak Tamani um, I also want to thank David Sehwak for uh, welcoming me to the university and also Nakokmi Mareluk to Tivai and Rebecca. I am so proud of both of you. You are doing excellent work at this great university. Chancellor, elders, members of the faculty, graduates, and distinguished guests, thank you very much for the warm welcome and the wonderful honor of being able to speak to you today. I am really delighted to be here. I'm especially delighted because my family is here. I, my husband, Witt, and our children and our grandchildren are here. Michaela, Mary, Selena, Jack, and baby Abby are all here. So I really appreciate their presence and my daughter Carol and my son Whitney and his wife, Jenny. It is really my distinct pleasure to address this very vi vibrant group of young graduates that are in front of me today. The message I hope to leave you with you today is the importance of the past in building the future. When I was reflecting on what I should say to all of you young graduates today, I thought that, th that this message, learning from the past, is always an important aspect of building the future, was an important message to leave with you. I would like to take a moment to reflect on the past because throughout my career, I have been strongly guided by my early years in northern Quebec. As a young girl, my family, my family and I lived in Kangatsualujuak in northern Quebec. We lived what was then a very traditional lifestyle, unilingual Inuit, my mother and my grandmother, speaking only Inuktitut, we traveled only by tog teams, and we were always out hunting, fishing, and gathering for our food. We lived out on the land if we weren't in school, in tents or log houses that my father built. And with the stove, wood stove blaring hot, my grandmother Jeannie would teach us all the legends of the Inuit and about our culture and our history. She also taught us how family ties and relationships were at the core of Inuit culture. Those early days grounded me in my culture and language throughout my lifetime. Though I didn't fully understand it then, those early days or early years living a traditional Inuit lifestyle were undoubtedly my first introduction to leadership and to the values that would guide me through my own leadership experiences many years later. Those values that I internalized at a very young age, integrity, honesty, and determination, have served me well in my life in several ways. I think leadership is all about being what your values are. In my case, 
on the good days and the bad, being a person of integrity, honesty, and determination. Also, I think that adversity plays a key role in shaping leaders because the outcome of adversity can often be the gift of compassion and resilience. It has been so in my life. From time to time, I have learned that leadership demands these sacrifices. It necessitates drawing on a sense of purpose and determination to guide you through, and once you have arrived, it has built a new level of emotional competency for your next date with adversity. I have also learned as a leader that when you are faced with adversity, it is important to draw on an inner life of experiences to help you through. I've talked about the values that have shaped my leadership and the role that adversity has played in my life. I would now like to talk briefly about the role of risk and informed experimentation in leadership. In thinking back on my career, whether as an ambassador to Denmark or ambassador for circumpolar affairs or chancellor of Trent University, or even today as national leader for Inuit in Canada, the so-called breakthrough moments almost always involved decision makers thinking across boundaries. And in this stage, in this age of connectivity, we need reward, we need to rewar reward cross-boundary thinking which is sometimes called thinking outside of the box. Now more and more, more than ever, we need these qualities in our leaders of today and tomorrow, especially when we look at the issues we are dealing with in the Arctic, such as the health and well-being of, of Inuit, climate change, which is resulting in an ice-free Northwest Passage, which I'm sure you have heard of uh, for, for a number of years now. Sovereignty of, in the Arctic has become a big issue. Other issues that we deal with include the United States listing of the polar bear as threatened, the European ban on seals and seal products, in also potential for major resource development or extraction, which includes environmental issues and potential economic benefits to Inuit and other Canadians. Also issues of implementation of the land claims agreements that have been signed by all Inuit regions, and also the issue of abuses in the former residential schools era. The list can go on. But those were the ones I just wanted to give you an example of. Another very important initiative is something that I have been working on for about a year and a half. It's a new national strategy for Inuit education. And it's a vision of how we would like to implement our education system all across the Arctic for Inuit children and youth, so that we start to educate and graduate our children. Because right now, the graduation rate from high school is only 25%. So on June the 16th, we, we are going to launch the first ever national strategy on Inuit education. Uh, I'd like to just touch a little bit more on leadership because someday I am sure n all of you or some of you will, will become leaders in your community or nationally or regionally. Your future is, is before you. Leadership involves opening the space to create communities of people who support each, each other in a common goal.
and we need people, as I said, like you, to facilitate that process. I would like to end by briefly talking about the role of leadership in organizations, whether they are non-governmental organizations or governments. My approach to leadership in, a, in any organization draws from these early experiences of community. I treat everyone as I expect to be treated with respect. I recognize that no job can be done alone, and that job gets done with leaders build, when leaders build and nurture relationships that produce desirable results for the organization. I also encourage you to be curious, to seek out an understanding of other perspectives, and where conflicting or contradictory perspectives arise, mediate solutions. Finally, I believe that leaders need to consult well and communicate often. Consultation should mean consultation, not communicating predetermined results. Communication also means understanding how to reach specific audiences. So I am urging all of you to build on that training and hone your skills for communicating with Aboriginal Canadians. That difficult road between a nation's experience and its destiny involves you. It involves you exploring the outer reaches of possibility, inspired by determination, curiosity, and the courage to think creatively. Enjoy your day of recognition for all that you have achieved, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you today.